Seawolves and welcome back to the show. Super happy to be back. Super happy that the Gallada Bermudes 1000, which I think is actually a 1200 mile race, but for some reason it's called the, 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 the 1000, uh, is about to happen. in Brest uh, this Sunday. Again, the pre-start activities have already started. They're already sailing today. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I know that, uh, of course, the rest of the Seawolves are very much looking forward to it also. And uh, it means that we're we're back on. The Maka season is officially starting. Uh, we're gonna do coverage of it every day. So uh, today's Saturday, of course, it's Friday evening, actually, as I'm taping this. Um, but uh, so uh, today, Saturday morning, when you, uh, dear viewer, are watching this, and then, of course, Sunday after the start, we'll do an update, and then we'll do an update every day for as long, at least, as the race lasts, which will be probably four to maybe six, seven days, depending a bit. Uh, on the weather. Uh, in the end of this episode, also an update on the Volvo 65 clinics, the long-awaited Volvo 65 clinics, which are uh, happening, but actually going to be happening in three locations. So uh, more on that in the uh, near the end of the episode. For now, let's uh, get started with the one thing that I know that all of you, of course, the loyal fans are uh, waiting for, because uh, there's no way to enjoy the mocker racing from the comfort of your home without a nice drink, so uh, here we go. A lovely bit of cafe for me, but anything you put in there is fine. Of course, works best if you have your Seawolf mug there, still very available uh, through our seawolfstv.com website. Here we go, three, two, one, cheers. <laughs> That, uh, that little bit of sailing beauty with, uh, with Pip Hare. More of Pip uh, actually uh, later in the episode. I did an interview with Pip about two weeks ago. Uh, I don't know actually if I will edit that, some of the parts of it maybe into this episode. We'll see where the conversation uh, takes us. But uh, let's start first with uh, uh, the race that's about to happen. So Sunday we have the start of the Gaillard de Bermudes. And um, this is basically the first uh, you know, real moment when most, not all by any means, but 
most of the Amaka fleet is now back in the water. There are still several new boats that are under construction currently, um, but most of the boats that already existed and that were kind of refitted are back in the water uh, again. Uh, so it's going to be the first moment where we will see kind of the new field of boats really going head to head in a proper full-on Imoka race. There have of course been a few races where some of the Imokas have participated over the summer, but no full-on Imoka battles uh, yet. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to see uh, what is going to happen here. And uh, the racetrack, although there still might be some changes depending on the weather, uh, the start of course in Brest, uh, then uh, the fleet is going to make their way to the infamous slash famous Fastnet Rock and from there they're gonna go south towards uh, a point, kind of like a, a digital uh, waypoint I guess, somewhere uh, quite quite a distance off the coast of, uh, of Cape Finisterre, which of course makes it uh, well very close to kind of like a, a, a semi-start of the uh, actual Van de Globe race. It's the first race that really counts as a qualification race also for the Van de Globe because it's important to finish several uh, in a, a Maka circuit races for before the great uh, race and there, there are not that many of them um, so that's important and uh, also uh, yeah it, it's a first test with several new skippers several new boats so we'll see what happens maybe six days depend on the weather should be probably enough for the fleet to uh, complete this race and uh, the fleet is growing very fast we have 24 24 it's incredible uh, Imok has registered to actually start in this race and uh, like I said that's not even the full fleet yet I think there are seven or eight new boats still under construction right now all hoping to uh, get onto the water in the well, most of them in the next two, three, maybe four months uh, or so, a few even a little bit later, like scheduled kind of in the end of the year, um, but most of them coming online pretty soon. So it should be a lot of fun to see kind of what the different uh, development uh, strategies uh, are. And that brings me to kind of the first uh, point that I wanted to talk today, because uh, there have been some, there's been a big meeting of the uh, kind of the Imoka class, all the skippers got together and voted on new ideas and several new ideas that we've also featured on the show in the previous months um, have been, have kind of made it to the, the top of the uh, conversation list, let's say within the uh, Maka circuit. Uh, one of which is the uh, the T rudder. So uh, you all, I, I see, I'm sure, have seen the video by now of uh, Bureau Valet. We also featured it here a while back, where uh, Lewis Burton had uh, kind of mounted an experimental uh, a rudder with a small T foil uh, on top, which kind of allows the uh, Emoka to actually achieve proper flight, so full uh, foiling. And uh, well, we've all seen the video. The speed increase and stability was uh, amazing. Uh, and um, yeah, so you know, uh, I've reported it before. There's been some serious conversation. I think everybody thinks it's a great idea. However, uh, for lots of different reasons, for at least the time being, uh, they have voted uh, not to allow that into the class yet. But it does seem, as I have predicted a little bit earlier, that uh, maybe at some point there, there's also some talk of maybe standardizing the rudder at some point that uh, it's still too early but if we get to a point where both the rudder well actually where the, where the Imakas will kind of move towards a standardized rudder just like we have a standardized mast so everybody has the same mast same uh, specs etc that that will also be standardized probably that will coincide with the addition of kind of allowing and maybe you know, right away standardizing 
uh, that foil. So uh, it's not happening right now, but it's uh, at least a small step closer. So that's kind of interesting to know that that really is a development that I think at some point we can expect to uh, be entering the Amaka field, which is really uh, cool. Another thing is that um, there's been a kind of a major actually development on the rules surrounding the foils because um, after the Vendée Globe, we saw, of course, a kind of a bit of a foiling explosion. Well, before and after, we saw a foiling explosion where there's been lots of different experiments with uh, different type of foils. You've all seen the difference between, uh, for example, uh, Crea Paprec or uh, uh, Corum, for example, and uh, the, the Bureau Ballet, where we have very radically different designs in foils. Now, well, one of the things that are, is, of course, really uh, a continuous challenge within the Amoka. Uh, kind of class is that all this stuff is completely new development and so it's just ridiculously expensive and of course if everybody uses uh, the same foils or if some of the aspects of the foils were say standardized that could potentially um, you know open the class to more people by making you know at least part of uh, of the kit a little bit more uh, affordable or making some parts like uh, making foils, for example, interchange more easily interchangeable, let's say, between different boats, things like that. So there are definitely a lot of points that are uh, good to say where, where it would make sense to uh, standardize either parts or the entire foils at some point. But, uh, and I, I think smartly, they've decided uh, not to do that for now. There, there's definitely, you know, people are seeing the that they're, that they're probably more sooner than later, that it will make sense to um, standardize maybe parts of the foils. But for now, they've been looking at lots of different ways to kind of rein in a little bit the um, financial aspect, I think, especially of the foil creation, because when you have teams that have you know virtually unlimited budgets, but you have other teams that are maybe much more on a constrained budget, but also do want to have a chance to seriously compete, uh, then you have to kind of put some kind of constraint so that you know that there's something that is a little bit tempering this um, trend of getting bigger and bigger and more expensive uh, foils. And so after a lot of deliberation, the Amoka class decided to solve that by going for a volume uh, rule. So I think the let me check my notes here. Uh, the volume right now is set at 8.3. Uh, cubic, I don't have any minute here, but I think it's 8.3 cubic meters. So that's a volumetric um, uh, limitation. So that means that that will be the maximum volume of the foils, which is uh, an interesting choice because there's actually two, maybe three boats in the, in the fleet that have foils that are actually far exceeding uh, that volume. So uh, Bureau Valet 2 and I think, uh, uh, I think uh, Corum, the Parlange, uh, and I think one more, but I forget the name right now, are currently fitted with foils that are more around like 13 cubic meters or something in volume or nine. So quite a bit higher than that 8.3 measurement, but they've adopted a grandfather rule that they can basically keep so any team that has foils that are larger, let's say, than that volume right now, uh, can continue using the current design that they have. But if they introduce a new design, then they will have to uh, reduce the uh, volume of the foils to a maximum of that uh, 8.3 uh, square uh, cubic meter volume. So that's kind of an interesting um, change, and it's uh, you know most of the boats are a little bit over that, so it's a fairly conservative measure, let's say. And uh, yeah, I'm very interested to see what it will do uh, for the fleet. But so, so these are kind of the, the things, like there, there are many other smaller things, but these are kind of the big things that are, uh, you know, the big changes within the rules, let's say, that are, that are very interesting and I think can be very beneficial uh, for the fleet. And we'll have to see how that uh, works out. So let's talk a little bit about the fleet that we have. I know that a lot of you really appreciated that uh, when we did the Vending Globe last time, that I kind of made a, um, you know, kind of three separate groups within the Amaka field and kind of picked one boat in each one of those throughout the Vendiglo race to kind of see how they were competing against each other. Because I think it's a 
Well, it's a very interesting frame to kind of look at the race. And I think I'll do that again for the upcoming season. So, and that also allows us kind of, you know, as, a, as friendly competitors amongst each other to make predictions and to say, well, who in this group, who in that group, etc. And so uh, the groups that I'm kind of looking at the race and we'll do so also this time is that we have really the newest boat. So we have kind of the cutting edge designs, let's say. We have the um, slightly older boats uh, so, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, etc. Uh, kind of ranges uh, that are a little bit older now, but, are, but, but are, which really are by no means necessarily inferior to the very new boats. It's just that they weren't really designed that way initially, but they have been, you know, gradually updated still and are more or less should be able performance wise to still get very close to those super new designs that are coming uh, out now still. And then we have behind that kind of the third group, which is really the much more uh, older boats, right? We have the kind of the dagger boards, uh, board boats, the non-foiling boats, etc. Although this season, actually all the boats are foiling, uh, but we that used to be the, the, the defining thing for the category last edition, I guess. Now we have, I think all, only uh, foiling boats or at least dagger board boats in the group. Uh, but um, yeah, we have some older boats there and so that's also a good way to kind of look at them because they have some advantages, a little bit better upwind performance, for example, with the non-foiler still, but when it comes to downwind, of course, it's a very different uh, matter. So let's take a little bit of a look at some of the uh, newcomers or updated uh, comers, let's say, and, uh, and what comes behind there. So if we start with kind of the cutting edge that's on the water uh, right now, one of the last boats, of course, to hit the, the water has been uh, the, 11, the new 11th hour uh, boat, uh, Malama. And, um, you know, ha has been performing fairly well so far, did fairly good in the uh, Ocean Race uh, Europe, created for both the Vendee eventually, but also to be exceptionally well um, adapted for this uh, multi-crew uh, racing that is happening in the Europe race, so a very interesting uh, boat. And then next to there, of course, we have names that, are, or, that were already in the circuit for a little bit longer. Uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, well, the, the new Hublot, so the former uh, Alex Thompson uh, Hugo Bosbo, which has been uh, refitted very nice, some very nice new colors. It looks really incredible, uh, I think, as you can see here in the videos uh, in the screen as I'm uh, talking about it. Very interesting boat. And uh, of course, now with Alan Rora uh, at the helm, who, who really couldn't deserve it more after the, the kind of disastrous uh, things that happened in his uh, Van de Globe, especially the oil problems that he had were basically uh, pretty early in the race. He had a massive oil leak in his, uh, in his engine, really flooding the entire uh, uh, inside of the boat which meant that he had to pretty much do the entire rest of the race with a slippery uh, slide inside of his uh, Maka, very, very tough. So I really hope that this time around he'll be a bit more lucky. Uh, really amazing uh, a sailor. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if anybody can really push this boat to its maximum potential, I, I think uh, Ellen is a good uh, candidate for that. And I'm very curious to see the actual performance because despite the uh, great amount of anticipation, of course, that has been here uh, for this particular boat, because of course it was Alex at, at first uh, who, uh, who kind of created and grandfathered it. Uh, and, uh, and of course he was really definitely one of the big favorites for the last Van Day. Um, it wasn't to be, uh, but uh, we saw with Alex that uh, both in the first race, when I think they did, uh, I think it was the Route du Rhum, or uh, there was another, uh, or a transatlantic or something like that, right before the Vendée Globe, and actually uh, wrecked the, the keel, so had to repair the boat. We're only just in the nick of time ready for the Vendée. And of course, we all know what happened there with the massive um, damage and delamination, etc., in, uh, in the front of the boat, probably uh, due to his very close proximity uh, sailing to a uh, full-on uh, uh, low pressure uh, in the, well, so, somewhere uh, on, the, on the northern Atlantic. So uh, we haven't really seen a, a very long stretch of performance from this boat. There hasn't been a real full-on uh, first finish uh, by this boat, really. So uh, it's kind of all fresh. It's all on the table and it could go, uh, it could go anyway. So we, we might see that this boat is still 
uh, really outperforming uh, some of the other newer, newer boats uh, by a lot. Uh, it might be kind of in the middle of the field, it might, it might not be, there might be other technical problems. We'll see. I'm personally very interested to see where Alan will take it and uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens uh, this week. Then of course uh, there is uh, Ling Dao, Thomas Ruyant's boat, which has been performing excellently all throughout the Vendée, but also all the later races, uh, kind of in the summer season where, where it uh, performed admirably. So uh, yeah, very, very high hopes there, but nothing too uh, uh, crazy to report. Uh, then uh, Quorum, of course, this master in the last Vendée Globe have been doing very well so far uh, since then. No other major technical issues, but they are one of the teams that are kind of dealing with this uh, new rule that I just explained. So their fours, I think, are 13 or 14 uh, square meters, uh, uh, cubic meters, I should say, right now. And so they are one of the boats that will have to um, either stick with the fours that they have right now. Uh, or if they have to ever, if they want to ever redo their foil package, then they will have to comply with this rule and make the foils that they have now significantly um, smaller. So, and, and especially Quorum, I would say, I'm very interesting what that means for them because of, of course that boat is really one of the ships that really stands out. The design is quite different from all of the other designs in the same way that Hugo Boss, for example, is very different or Bureau Valide is again a very kind of different concept, how the foils are fitted, uh, how they're shaped. It's all really quite unique to that particular boat. So in my estimation, it also kind of needs that bigger uh, foil. It's built for that bigger volumetric uh, foil. And so I'm pretty curious to see uh, what the impact will be. I haven't really seen any interviews on, on it yet uh, where they kind of comment on the rule, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, there. Then of course we have Chiral, Jeremy Bijou. Uh, yeah, amazing what he did in the last uh, Vendée. And I think that, yeah, that ship was always very, very highly uh, competitive. And uh, it's unfortunate that he had kind of the trouble that he had in the beginning of the race uh, last time, but it really does seem that the boat is in top uh, shape right now. And uh, I think uh, he was a big favorite for the last Vendée Globe. And I definitely think that he could still be again uh, a big favorite by the time that the next Vendée Globe comes around. And I definitely see him somewhere very high in the top 10 uh, also in this upcoming race uh, that's coming up now. Then we have, of course, uh, Bureau Valet, Lewis Burton's uh, new boat, the former Loxy 10, uh, Armel Trippon's uh, ship. And uh, yeah, like I said, so they've been experimenting with the T-foils, but uh, on, or the T-rudders, I should say. But uh, on the other hand, also the boat has been, you know, very, very fast, very, very stable. It's definitely one of the most innovative designs, one of the latest boats to, uh, to hit the water still within the feud, one of the newest boats. So uh, we'll see what happens there. It will be a very, very interesting, uh, uh, kind of battle between all this very very new cool boat in this particular race. Uh, then we have uh, Apivia, uh, well also one of the one of the newer boats that could really measure itself against the best and we saw incredible performance of course also during pretty much the whole uh, Vendée Globe uh, race uh, was uh, was in first position for a long time. Uh, and then of course we have uh, the, the Charlie Enright's 11th hour racing boat, which I already uh, mentioned. Now, not all of those super new boats are actually in this race right now. Not all of them are actually uh, uh, going to participate. Then there are also, there's kind of a group of boats, so kind of a bit more the grandfather boats that were, that are by no means uh, old, but that have a, you know, a few years um, and, and you know maybe already uh, one Vendée Globe of uh, or uh, let's say have already done like two Vendée Globes uh, a boat like for example uh, the new Medallia so a Pip Harris boat which of course uh, the uh, number three I think in last race and number one in the race before that so pretty impressive performance record and still the record holder for the entire Vendée Globe race uh, which wasn't improved on last edition. So a very, very fast boat, but a little bit older. However, uh, with a good foil package, still the little bit shorter, older foils, but the uh, boat looks amazing, performs amazing. Uh, like I said, I did an interview uh, with Pip about three weeks ago or so. We haven't published it yet, but that will be uh, coming online also soon, probably somewhere in the next few days. I kind of saved it uh, for there. So that should be fun. And we get a bit more details about what they're doing uh, with the boat. 
some other boats kind of in that group, uh, for example, uh, uh, Kajori Sharishi's uh, boat, the Mori Global One. Uh, that's also a very new boat. Uh, and so uh, 2019, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, even though the performance in the Vende Globe wasn't necessarily super uh, impressive because it just had a lot of uh, technical uh, problems and breakages, so that naturally slowed his attempt down. But uh, potentially, it's still one of the later boats to hit the water. It's one of the newer boats, has great foils on it. So uh, potentially, it's still one of the faster uh, entries. Then, of course, we have uh, uh, boats that are kind of coming out, so we have a new Malaysia Sea Explorer um, 2, Boris Herman's new boat, not underwater yet. We have uh, Yannick Besthaven, the, the winner of last edition, who uh, will be uh, releasing a new Maitre Coq, uh, but that's also not in the water yet. I hear somewhere in June, probably. Uh, we have uh, VNB Mayenne, uh, now piloted by uh, Philippe Blatt. Uh, that's also not on the water yet and we have of course the PRB from uh, Kevin Escoffier which uh, of course the boat that famously uh, broke off the coast of uh, South Africa uh, rescued by uh, a, a certain uh, Frenchman with a certain uh, catchphrase which I shall not repeat here <laughs> and, uh, and his boat is uh, also uh, set to hit the water uh, soon there has been some video of it already it looks pretty cool they're doing some pretty cool things with that um, and we have also uh, you know boats like uh, Group Apicil for example so that's the, actually the winning boat from uh, from last year the former um, uh, Demian Sequins uh, boat now and we have uh, La Miseline so that's the former initiatives Kerr uh, of course uh, had the, 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 the break of the rudder of South Africa also uh, last year Time, but uh, back in good shape again, and we have um, Fortuna's best weather, best western, and that's the uh, former Malasia, so Boris Herman's old boat, uh, which is now a Roman Athanasio's uh, ship. So, you know, kind of gives a good example of the kind of different types of combinations. We have completely new boats, we have some boats that are still pretty new and updated, and we have some older boats, but that are by no means uh, slow, which kind of uh, have maybe some older foils, etc., but could still be very uh, competitive. So uh, that brings me to, for now, my top 10 in this particular race. I'll give you uh, what I think might be the end uh, results. So we'll see how good I am at predicting uh, from this moment on. And then we'll get into a little bit of weather prediction, of course, although, yeah, it's still hard to uh, predict and we don't exactly know the whole route uh, yet. It's not 100% confirmed because the weather is maybe at this point a little bit unfavored, uh, unfavorable uh, to this particular racetrack. But we'll see. Anyways, my top 10. And of course, I'm also curious about your uh, top 10. So uh, put it in the comments uh, below if you like to participate. I'm, uh, I'm going to say that uh, Linked Out is going to be uh, ending up in number one with this. Uh, then I have Apivia. I have uh, Bureau Valet right after that. I have Chiral in number four. I have a group Apicil number five. I have uh, Eleonora in Hublot in number six. I have Corum number seven. I have Medallia at eight, uh, just to support people a little bit there, of course. And I have uh, La Miseline at nine and Massif at uh, number 10. That's a little bit my wild card, but uh, I think it could happen. So uh, put your top 10 in the uh, comments below if you like to participate and have a little uh, fun and see uh, which one of us uh, Wolves predicts it right this time. Um, let's see what else we have to talk about. Yes, of course, uh, the weather. So uh, follow me into the screen and we'll see what's going on right now. So here we are at the uh, weather on Sunday and it immediately kind of uh, shows the trouble with the particular racetrack. Uh, because, of course, uh, we're going to be more or less, uh, we're going we're to be starting somewhere here. And uh, then we are going to have to move, of course, uh, towards the, uh, the fastened rock somewhere in this area. Uh, but as you can see, the, uh, there is a, a severe lack of wind on the way, which is going to be, uh, unfortunately, exactly uh, on the racetrack and moving towards the racers. Um, as they try to uh, make their way over there. And, uh, and we see that uh, only around Monday morning uh, will there be slowly some more wind heading towards uh, the fleet. So that's fairly uh, unfortunate. After that, it seems pretty good. 
But then we run into another uh, uh, kind of troublesome thing because the, the point uh, of Finisterre somewhere where they are going to have to race after they've been to the Fasten Rock is well, somewhere around here. And um, yeah, that, that's, uh, the, the wind is said to be perhaps, as you can see, fairly unfavorable. Uh, coming coming from there, it would be a complete and full uh, upwind uh, battle possibly, uh, and then we see that this very strong wind, also very much in the wrong direction, uh, is is kind of heading uh, for the fast net. So yeah, that's uh, that's why the the race organization is still not completely confirmed on the uh, race. So I'm curious to see what happens, but. As we don't have like a full confirmation of the racetrack, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do the whole uh, route right now because it might change. So we'll, we'll do that maybe a little bit before the start or a little bit after, um, when we actually know what the route will be and also where the Finisterre waypoint will be. But that's kind of the situation for now. So definitely it looks like on the start of the race on Sunday, there will be little to no wind and there won't be any for the first 24 hours, so it looks like a pretty slow start. Maybe they will choose to postpone the start to Monday when the, when the wind should be a little bit better. We'll have to see. Uh, after that, seems like we have like about a day of good wind at least to uh, you know get uh, past the inland, to get towards the island, to get towards the Fastnet Rock. But after that, we see that uh, some very unfavorable uh, weather to uh, get back to that point at Finisterre. So maybe they'll come up with uh, something else, maybe some other waypoint, maybe a waypoint that's a little bit more closer, taking into account that the whole uh, way will be completely upwind sailing. We'll have to see, there's no way to predict the future, so uh, that's uh, it for the weather uh, right now. Which brings me to uh, the last point on the show today, which is of course the Volvo 65, the long-awaited Volvo 65 uh, clinic. So uh, we're changing the, webs uh, the website also uh, today with the updated information. Uh, if you have your ticket already, you're going to receive an email with the kind of the updated uh, facts over uh, the weekend. So you'll get it all in writing. And uh, basically, so the boat changed sponsors. It's no longer uh, childhood now, but it is uh, Jonsen and De Jong. And uh, as we had planned to uh, do some workshops in May here in um, in Eimuiden, here in Holland, and it is now uh, the start of May, so that would have been uh, fairly soon. However, uh, the boat was uh, well had to change its direction, unfortunately for us, to uh, Jeddah in the uh, United Emirates. Uh, so that's where the boat is right now. However, we probably will have an option to sail there if we want to. So that's my first question to you guys. You can also find it on the website. If you are living in that area, which of course is very possible uh, when you're watching this, or if you're close enough or willing to travel to Jeddah to do uh, the workshop there on board of Janssen and the young Volvo 65, that's going to very likely be possible. However, before we actually book a date, uh, I would like to see how many of you want to go so that we're sure that we have a group that's big enough. So if you are willing, and I mean really willing, to go to the United Emirates and um, in Jeddah and uh, visit the team there and have an incredible sailing experience there, uh, then uh, please let us know through the, e uh, through the email. So that's uh, contact at seawolvestv.com. Uh, then in June, the boat's gonna come back from Jeddah to, uh, to Amsterdam, well, to, um, to uh, The Hague, uh, actually. We're gonna have options probably for one of two of you, maybe to join on the delivery of that. More info on the website on that also when it happens. But uh, there is going to be the workshops here in uh, The Hague or in uh, Eimuiden. So if you have uh, a seat for a workshop right now and you just want to have it in Holland because that's kind of what you counted on and that's kind of the best location for you, uh, that's, those are going to happen, but they're going to be happening in the beginning of June. Uh, exact dates, again, check uh, the website, keep an eye on the website, or if you already have your ticket, uh, you will get that information in the email and we will present you with several date options so you can kind of pick what works the best for you and then we'll make the groups and see if we have enough for each day to make that happen. And if not, then we'll move some other things around again to make it happen. Then we have a third option, which is most likely, it's not 100% for sure yet, is going to be in uh, Helsinki, I think. Um, because that's where the boat is heading next after it goes into a short refit 
here in Holland after we do the workshops in June. And so uh, more options on that date later. But if you're living in that area and you feel like, oh, actually uh, that, that would be fine to have my workshop there and you already get your ticket, uh, that will also be included in the emails. So uh, you'll get the information through that way. And so uh, that's it for the update. I'm very, very happy that it's finally going to uh, happen. Can't wait to get on board myself. Also kind of hope to get on board this month, but uh, since they're in Jeddah and I'm very, very busy uh, here, that is unfortunately not gonna happen yet. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Well, that's it for the show today. Really uh, hope you enjoyed. And uh, I guess I will see you guys tomorrow. Ciao, ciao. Have a nice day.